When was the last time you checked your dog or cat's teeth? There is a good chance, just based on statistics, that everything ain't going right in there with your dog or your cat. And oh, can I attest to this? All of the animal, oh, I've had so many cats, a few dogs in my adult life. And boy, oh boy, over and above everything else, the most common thing, the most common thread is dental health. And I fell into, when I was younger, uh, I definitely fell into, we've talked about this before, the do everything your veterinarian says to do. Like, that was my mindset. I fed all of the different kibbles that were for sale behind the counter, did all the jabs, blah, 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 you name it. And I will tell you, my animals have been in those statistics of the animals in the United States, at least, where we have just some of the worst dental health in our pets. And if we think about, I mean, it's dental health, obesity, and the obesity is causing so many other diseases and illnesses. These are like some of the things that are plaguing our pets more than anything. Well, we're in February now, and February is Dental Health Awareness Month for pets in the veterinary profession. So I decided, I was blessed, to be honest with you, to have Dr. Katie Kangas join me for today's podcast episode. If you're not familiar with Dr. Katie Kangas, she has a veterinary practice in San Diego, California, and she is an absolutely lovely human being, I, I might say. I met her in person first at the AHVMA conference last year, and then kind of followed each other over to the Feed Real Summit because they were both in San Diego a few days apart um, in October last year. And she is just an incredible human being, a wonderful veterinarian. She was spoke on the panel at the Feed Real Summit. And one of my biggest takeaways, I had, there were so many takeaways from the Feed Real Summit. Um, two of my biggest ones, First was Amy Renz of Goodness Gracious, and I had her on the podcast already to talk to you about metabolic disease, which is something, again, we definitely need to talk more about um, just based on the statistics and the health of our pets. But for February, for dental health awareness with our pets, with our dogs and our cats, Dr. Katie Kangas uh, on the panel spoke about dental care, and that is one of her specialties. And I have I had a pet peeve going into today's interview, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I found out it's also one of her pet peeves, thank goodness, because sometimes we bring things up to people and we're like, you know, do do I tiptoe around this? What if I hate this and she loves this or or I love this and she hates this? You never know, right? So I, I tried not to tiptoe around it. I just went full force in. I don't like this. What do you think? <laughs> and she doesn't like it either. Um, and it's becoming more and more prevalent with our dog dogs, especially. I imagine there may be some cats rolled up into this as well, but Gosh, I hope not. But anyway, we're going to talk more about that in today's episode of the Pet Parenting Reset. So what, regardless of how you feel about your pet's dental hygiene, their, their dental health, there is this is a really, really huge topic. And we just spoke about the actual hygiene part of it. We could get more into like the oral microbiome, which Dr. Katie Kangas did touch on just a little bit. But I think that deserves its own episode. We'll bring that at, at a later date. So for dental health awareness for our pets, please welcome with me to the Pet Parenting Reset, Dr. Katie Kangas. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Dr. 
Dr. Katie Kangas, thank you so much for joining me and being here to talk to my listeners. I'm so excited to have you. I got to meet you for the first time um, in San Diego last year, and you were just a ball of fun. So, (laughs) so happy to have you on the podcast. Um, We are going to talk a little bit today about dental health for our pets. Uh, But before we do that, you are an integrative veterinarian. You have a lot of experience under your belt. Can you, I'd like you to just say hi, introduce yourself, and maybe talk a little bit about how you wound up in that integrative field, incorporating holistic modalities into your pet's care. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'll start off by saying thank you for the opportunity to join you today and to help contribute some, you know, good topics of of understanding for all your listeners and kudos to all of your listeners for taking the time to, you know, listen and learn. And we're all constantly learning, even integrative veterinarians with Well, I have 30 years of experience as a veterinarian, uh, but I have more than 15 years experience as a holistic veterinarian. So, uh, and that's, a, I guess, a good lead in to, you know, kind of the question that you just asked is to explain a little bit about my background. So again, my, my name is Dr. Katie Kangas and my practice is integrative veterinary care and I am in San Diego. Uh, and I have a lot of different things in my past that I did as a veterinarian. I started out actually doing exotics and wildlife and did some zoo work and some exotics clinic work. Uh, and then I fell into shelter medicine along the way. And that was very near and dear to my heart still. And, you know, rescue groups and working with all of them. Uh, and I was the medical director of San Diego Humane Society and SPCA for uh, several years uh, back in the early 2000s. And at that time, my my girl, my pet, um, her, her a black lab mix named Asti, she started having aging issues with mainly mobility and some weakness in her hind end and started, you know, falling down and having a lot of difficulty with um, her movement and even defecating and things like that. So I'd always been interested in holistic healthcare, or at least I had been for many years prior to that, but just didn't really know anybody personally, veterinarians that were practicing that way. Um, And then of course, as oftentimes our animals are our best teachers and our best inspirations, uh, my dog Asti inspired me to, uh, you know, learn and, and move forward with finding somebody who could mentor me and learn more about being a holistic veterinarian. So, um, because we got such great results when I did find somebody, uh, Dr. Keith Weingart, who is still, of course, I'm very, very close to, uh, he was in my city at that time. And the results that I got with my dog, Asti, were extraordinary. And so I knew that I had to resign from my shelter position and go and learn and started with acupuncture, branched out into nutrition, advanced food therapy, herbal therapy, took courses on homeopathy, et cetera, et cetera. So um, now my focus really kind of comes from a very comprehensive standpoint, having all of those sort of holistic modalities and trainings that I have, um, you know, taken part in that uh, I really focus now on kind of a functional medicine approach and bring all of those pieces and all of those tools into my support network for, for my patients. And so functional medicine, really, I love to describe as, you know, finding the tools to help the pet's body or human's body function at optimum. So obviously the biggest tools are nutrition and food and diet. That's number one. Um, But we can bring in other tools like herbs and homeopathy, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other part of functional medicine and medicine in supporting the body to work well and our pet's bodies to work well is also avoiding things that are causing compromise to the body that are causing chronic inflammation and you know disease conditions etc cetera, etc cetera. so um so anyway functional medicine is really my my approach now um but bringing in all of those other facets um and Along the way, I've had an exceptional amount of training in dentistry and dental health. So that has also been one of my special interests. I'm definitely into gut health and microbiome. And I mean, any holistic practitioner, I mean, you know, that that's a a deep, you know, love and passion of ours. Um, But dental health happens to be another passion of mine. 
And once I was highly trained on the conventional side of understanding dental care for pets, I also was able to bring that into a wonderful understanding for anybody I get to, you know, teach and talk to and all my clients in understanding that dental health and oral health affects the whole body 24 seven. And so it is such an important piece of holistic health, whole body health. When we are investing in our pets, dental health and oral health, we are really investing in their whole body health, longevity, quality of life, et cetera. So it's really fun that, and I appreciate the fact that you suggested that to be our topic. Obviously, February is coming up. Most, all veterinarians know that February has been sort of, you know, coined as the dental care month where uh, pet dental care is, is much more promoted than, um, than, you know, other times of the year. But, you know, pet dental care is important always, but it's a perfect time of the year for us to bring this discussion into light. So thank you for suggesting this topic. Yeah, well, I, I heard you at the Federal Summit last last year, last year already. <laughs> I know. Um, and you were, you seemed so passionate about the dental health portion of everything that was being talked about on the panel. And I was like, this, this is going to be perfect. So <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, you know, we talk on this podcast, we talk so much about nutrition and I'm here for it because I lo it's my favorite thing to talk about too. Like I just can't learn enough about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, because it, you know, this, this episode will air in February. I did think it was going to be like the perfect time. It's on everybody's mind. It's flooding everybody's social media feed with, uh, you know, dental health for their pets. And what I found so interesting in my holistic journey, because my holistic journey started with my pets and then I started adopting different, like more holistic practices and caring for myself. It, and one of those things that I learned was with dentistry and in realizing that I needed to seek out, um, I have a holistic dentist now, was that our human dentist, and I don't know, this could very well be the same for traditional vet med, It's it seems like they they just don't understand the connection between the mouth and the rest of the body. It's like, it's just this thing that you go in and clean, but they don't understand the connection that it has to the rest of the body. Can you maybe speak to that a little bit, especially, I'm sure it's the same for us as it is for our pets. Oh, absolutely. And so it, it is well known. And I mean, I think every dentist understands because there are so many studies on how on literally the comorbidities of periodontal disease. So if if a pet or a human, an animal or a human has dental disease or periodontal disease, we know without a shadow of a doubt that the bacterial load and the chronic inflammation that is occurring in the in the oral tissues, the gingiva and the deeper structures, you know, below like around the tooth root and in the jaw and things like that, we know that that is being shared via the bloodstream from the gums to the rest of the body. And most people have heard that, you know, if you have a heart condition, periodontal disease definitely can, you know, cause an issue, or you might have to worry about endocarditis if you have a mouth infection and you have a, you know, cardiac issue. And back in the day, they used to tell people and even pets to take antibiotics prior to a veterinary procedure or prior to a dental procedure, if there was a heart condition. That really, fortunately, has fallen out of favor now in light of the overuse of antibiotics and, you know, driving antibiotic resistance and all that kind of stuff, which is good. But point being is most people have heard along the way through the years that your heart can be affected by dental disease, your kidneys and your liver can be affected by dental disease. But now we know everything can. I mean, there are studies to show arthritis can get worse with dental disease. IBD and IBS can get worse. Brain problems, you know. ADHD or cognition disorders, et cetera, et cetera. So we know it's really linked to everything because the bloodstream is carrying, you know, all of these factors to the whole rest of the body. Um, and I think that every human dentist knows that because they see these studies, they're taught this, but I love how you sort of brought that to light, Jessica, because I think most conventional doctors, whether it's a human doctor or a veterinary doctor, 
even though they know these things in the background, you know, they're so trained to be sort of narrow tracked, you know, a little narrow minded in their viewpoint of how they practice medicine, because they do get stuck in, you know, this is, this is the one category that I do. And sometimes the broad scope of the whole body health pattern sort of gets missed. Um, and so I think dentists understand it, but I think they really miss, you know, um, um, highlighting it or, or supporting it for people that they're, that they're treating. Um, when it comes to integrative veterinarians and kudos to you for finding a holistic, um, d- uh, dentist, human dentist, I also have a holistic or an integrative human dentist. So they do obviously procedures that a conventional dentist would do, but they also, do other things that they wouldn't, and they would do different um, aspects of those treatments differently in a more holistic and natural supportive way. So for instance, like my dentist and probably yours too uses ozone, ozone therapy to, you know, um, treat the gums, disinfect the gums, all that kind of stuff. They'll even inject ozone into, you know, a root canal when they're doing a root canal procedure to, um, to disinfect that or treat that without having to use antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. So it is really wonderful when you can find that resource. Um, unfortunately, to date, there not there isn't really at least none, nobody that I'm aware of. Although I'm sure it'll be on the on the horizon soon, but there aren't really holistic veterinary dentists available yet. But more and more veterinary dentists, or even just veterinarians in general, I mean, more and more of veterinary doctors are at least becoming aware and or interested in more natural means of supporting health. So, you know, we got good stuff coming, but, um, but it's not like a a pet parent can typically find a, a holistic dentist. However, I do recommend when at all possible for conventional veterinary care, dental care for pets, that a board certified veterinary dentist is absolutely optimal for dental care for pets, especially if there's anything advanced going on. And we can talk about this more, you know, in in our, in our full discussion, but um, really the level of dental care, certainly when it comes to surgical care, dental, which almost all dentistry care is, is surgical, the level of care that the pets will get from a specialist is by orders of magnitude, you know, above what most general practitioners would be able to do. And that differs from our human dentists. I mean, obviously everybody knows that your MD, your general doctor, and your dentist, your DDS, you know, credentialed person, completely different schooling. You know, I mean, they went through years of school just to work with the mouth. And veterinarians, we have four years of, you know, medical school after, you know, undergraduate years. And we literally get one to two months of dentistry in a four-year curriculum. You know, we might have a a half year long lecture and then we get like a month of clinical work. So it's a very small amount of training. And so really that, that does not put us out of regular veterinary school training. It doesn't put us at the caliber of what a human dentist has for people. So it's really nice to keep that understanding in scope so that if people have the opportunity to find a dental specialist in their area, uh, you know, and they generally are the, you know, price point for their procedures will be higher, but it's, it's, you know, they're worth it. I mean, the, the quality of work and the ability of what they can do for pets, um, is going to exceed what typical veterinarians are going to be able to offer. That's a very good point. And I know I've had my pets, goodness gracious, how many, I don't even know how many dental procedures <laughs> I've paid for with my pets, especially because I've primarily in my adult life had cats and cats are just a different beast. <laughs> we can do a Indeed. lot of the same things. I think it's just more difficult. And then of course, you know, in this process of learning from going to a more traditional mindset to a more holistic mindset. You know, my cats have certainly been there with me through all of that. So I certainly like the first half of their lives, they're all seniors now. The first half of their lives, I was under the kibble cleans their teeth because that's what my vet said. They, you know, like, (laughs) 
<laughs> that whole fallacy that I thought yes. was true for so long. But um, I don't, maybe you want to speak to that because I didn't even think about that before we started. Yeah, that's actually, I, I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes I almost forget that people still, that people still think that. Um, and it is a common belief because it was, you know, perpetuated by veterinarians for decades that, you know, people sort of just intuitively, although wrongly, um, thought that dry food would help to clean the teeth. And indeed, there were studies back in the 90s to prove that that was not true. Um, and they looked at pets that eat, you know, wet food and moist food versus pets that eat dry food. And there was no difference in, and this was before, you know, a lot of raw movement. So this was just, you know, probably standard wet food, not raw food, because we, we know, you and I know, and probably all of your listeners at this point too, that somebody eating, a pet eating raw food should have in general better dental health than a pet eating any other you know type of processed food whether it's canned or dry but we definitely know that wet food and dry food there's no difference in gingivitis scores um, and that's what's more important than even the tartar on the teeth and so if dry food was going to help anything and that's a that's an, the, a big if all it would do is maybe crack a little tartar off the crown of the tooth and but that doesn't matter to the health of the animal because unless you get at the gum line, unless you're rubbing along the gum line and, you know, getting things cleaner there, then it's, it's just cause tartar on the tooth itself is, co is a cosmetic issue. It's not a health issue. And so really we need something that's going to more affect the gum line. And we know that dry food doesn't do that. It's not going to rub up on the gums. And to be honest, everybody knows most pets don't really chew dry food anyway. You know, I mean, they might crunch one out of every, you know, handful of kibble that go down. Some dogs don't crunch anything and they literally just swallow everything whole. So, um, so yeah, so dry food definitely is not helping any of our pets um, for dental health or anything else. Uh, for that matter. And dry food generally is going to have a higher carbohydrate load and all, obviously the heavily processed ingredients. Those things are going to drive more dental disease and more, uh, you know, bad oral bacteria that we don't want in there. So dry food actually promotes dental disease rather than helping it. So I love to bust that myth for everybody that removing dry food from your pet's diet entirely is absolutely not going to decline any kind of dental or oral health. It will actually help it. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, because yeah, I forget that sometimes too. And then it'll pop in my head. Like I'll yeah. be talking about it's my good cat for people and it'll to pop know. into my head. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but okay. So you mentioned, and I, I think this is, this is going to be very, very important for so many people. You mentioned that if you're not affecting the gum line, and below the gum line, that what's the point, right? Basically. <laughs> yep. And, and one of my biggest pet peeves for so long has been these signs that go up in front of pet, pet food stores that are like, mm. you know, we're having, bring your pet in for this non-anesthetic dental, um, you know, next Saturday or whatever it is. And it has literally like, Ever since the first time I ever saw one of those signs, I'm like, what are you doing? This is such, in my mind, it is a waste of money. It is in, it, like unnecessary anxiety to the animal. And you're not even going to do a good job. You can't get under the gum line and you're not when you're, they're not under. I yep. Don't, it, I yeah, am so glad you brought this up, Jessica. And it was the perfect segue. Good job for tying that in. And now, you know, telling all of, of all of your listeners that, you know, it's the gum line that matters. So we know that, you know, dry food doesn't rub on the gum line, but that's also a great way to segue into what is happening with non-anesthetic dentistry. Because just like you, Jessica, when I see those signs, I cringe. Um, and I do get to really sort of bust that myth or that understanding with all of my clients when I get to speak to them directly too, because most you know, obviously well-meaning pet parents, well-intentioned pet parents want to avoid anesthesia as much as possible. Uh, and so they would often gravitate towards anesthetic free dentistries, believing though that that is giving their pet health value because otherwise why would they do it? Obviously. So it's really nice for you and I to clarify for everyone today that non-anesthetic dentistries 
very rarely are giving any health value. And if they are, it's generally very minimal. Okay. And sometimes it's zero and sometimes it's actually doing negative um, because it's possible that pets can get injured too. So you have an awake pet and unless this pet is very tolerant and you have a very skilled pet hygienist, which oftentimes is not the case, the majority of people out there doing these teeth cleanings have very little training, like literally a weekend seminar. I mean, this is, you know, now I do know there are some human hygienists that have gone over to, you know, I'd rather work with animals than people, you know, <laughs> um, and so they're doing, you know, pet dental cleaning. So if they were trained as a human hygienist, that would definitely be a huge step up from somebody who just had this really, you know, minimal training. But even then, even when they know what they're doing and they know how to do it, the potential to take an awake pet and to be able to curette or you know scrape we call scaling the teeth scale the the tartar and the plaque off of the teeth at the gum line and up into the subgingival space so we want to get up into that in a proper subgingival space for a dog it it could go as deep as three millimeters which by the way is the same sulcal space for a human um gingival sulcus in a human cats shouldn't go any deeper than a millimeter Dogs can go up to three millimeters and still be healthy or normal situation, but oftentimes the pockets are way deeper than that. They're five, six millimeters and beyond, and you got to get up there. And if it's be, if it's um, deeper than six millimeters, you can't even effectively clean it, even when they're under anesthesia with a curette um, or you know those ultrasonic scalers. And so, if anything's deeper than six millimeters, it needs treatment. It either needs a gingival fl gingival flap to get in there and treat it appropriately, or it needs extraction or some other, you know, more advanced procedure. So point being with the non-anesthetic is they need to get up there under the gum line and get that crap out, you know, the plaque and the tartar and all the bacterial junk that's hanging in there and really flush that out um, and then polish the teeth, et cetera. So not only do you need to get up under the gum line on all, you know, what we call the cheek or the buckle side of the teeth, but what about the lingual side, which is the tongue side on the inside? They're going to go in there on the inside by the tongue and be able to get up into all those gingival spaces around every tooth margin. I mean, that's, that's really nearly impossible. And you've got these sharp curettes. So again, if the animal moves, if their tongue moves, if whatever, I mean, you can, and so, you know, pets can, can get injured and it does happen or something in the mouth will lacerate. So that's really important. And the other thing that's important is they also should be probing with a periodontal probe. You know, protocols are to probe six spots around every tooth. This is what our dentists and our hygienists are supposed to be doing for us too. And most of them do, but I have I know that there are some offices that aren't even stellar at that for humans where they should be probing in six spots to see if, if that probe is sinking deep anywhere because periodontal pockets can be hidden and there can be abscessed, you know, teeth that are just on one aspect of the tooth. And you really have to find that if it is found for an animal or a human, the next step is to x-ray that area and to take x-rays and see what's going on because without a dental x-ray, then we don't know what is the appropriate treatment to get that pet's mouth, you know, healthier. And again, you, there's no way you can take a dental x-ray of an awake pet. You have to put this x-ray plate in their mouth. They have to sit there, you know, I mean, that, that just doesn't happen and they could bite down on it and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I am not a fan of non-anesthetic cleanings. What I really like people to understand is that generally at best, what you're getting is a cosmetic procedure. The teeth, if you have somebody who's good at cleaning the teeth and you have a tolerant pet that's going to allow it, they'll come out on the other side with cleaner looking teeth, but the health is not improved because under the gum line, there's still disease lurking. And I have personally seen many pets that have come into my practice over the years who have very clean looking teeth, the crowns, the crown is the part of the tooth we can see. And then, you know, under the gum line is the root. The crown will look very clean, but the gums are angry and red and purple and inflamed. And I'm like, ah, or even there's exposed roots like the gingival, you know, we call it gingival recession. The gingiva has receded up because the disease and the inflammation is so chronic and yucky that there's roots exposed. So I've had pets where the teeth are very clean and the root, I'm sitting there looking at the roots and the gums way up there and they're all angry and red. And I say to the pet parent, you know, wow, the, you know, there's big time dental disease, but the teeth are clean. They're like, oh yeah, because I go every month or every other month for 
anesthesia free cleaning. I'm like, well, did they tell you there's a lot of disease in your doggy's mouth? And they're like, no. Oh, well, yeah. And then sometimes they're like, yeah, they said there's a tooth loose and that, you know, I probably should get that looked at. You know what? I mean, it's just like a lot of stuff is, is not getting taken care of appropriately. And then pet parents are getting the false um, understanding or false belief that they actually did something that was of health value for the pet. So bottom line is Jessica, I absolutely agree with you. I think it is not a wise use of money. I think that it um, sets the stage for pets to have a very stressful time often. Um, and you know, you're not getting any value out of it. So I would much prefer to invest that money in either a, a proper, you know, veterinary professional d dentistry and, or more proactive stuff. And, you know, somewhere in this discussion, we can talk about that because obviously as a holistic, uh, veterinarian, even though I'm big on dental health and taking care of dental problems with appropriate conventional medicine and surgery when, when needed. I'm also all about being as proactive and integrative as we can to support dental health. And that's the empowering steps that we can give to people as well. Absolutely. Um, and I do want to talk about all of the prevent, because there's a lot, a lot of things mm -hmm. that can be done preventatively for our pets. And I just, I just want to say, I can't imagine what these pets are going through that our going in for these non-anesthetic dental cleanings because I can't even me like as a human you would think we have enough composure and willpower I can't go to my vet my vet my <laughs> see what I'm thinking I can't go to my <laughs> dentist without Valium. like I have to be on something I <laughs> they prescribe me like Valium or something I can't do it you know they're working in my mouth and I but it, that also is, you know, partly because just in my like growing up, I just never like I've had so much dental stuff, like procedures. Right. Like, I've had braces twice in my life. Like I was not it's, gifted. Yeah, by it's, God with it's daunting. You're. I mean, it's nice that you brought that up because when you really put yourself in a pet's shoes, <laughs> well, they don't wear shoes. Haha. -ha, um, pun pun there. But you know, when we really imagine what pets are going through. It is very nerve wracking. And, you know, even there's people like not only the, the emotional stressful part of it that you just described as, you know, sort of you've experienced too, but even the sensitivity of the gums, like there's a hygienist, you know, they'll off a good hygienist will often say, how sensitive are your gums? Would you like me to apply some topical anesthetic before I start digging around with the curette or the ultrasonic scaler? Cause some people like I'm pretty hardy, my gut, you know, and I was like, nah, you can skip it. I don't need that. But some people I've had hygienists tell me that unless they do that, some people literally can't even sit there and let you do it. They just, they're jumping in their seat. They're super sensitive, you know, and then you think about even just keeping your mouth open that long. Keeping your mouth, you know, the pet has to keep their, so again, when they're under anesthesia, the stress is not being experienced by them. The practitioner or the hygienist is able to see everything and do everything appropriately. The pet's able to have the mouth open without having to, you know, force it. So it is, um, you know, it, it is so important to understand all those factors and, and, you know, little pieces of it all. Yeah. So, you know, ideally in a perfect world, we're all gifted these beautiful puppies or kittens and we start out immediately with all of the proactive um you know dental hygiene things that I know you're getting ready to tell me about that's you know obviously we don't live in a perfect world and if your pet is experienced like they do have dental disease going on they do need to have their I say, we say teeth clean, but it's, it, and it is their teeth, but like really the, the gums and, and everything, they need to have that done. So what are, can you, can you give me some of these like proactive things that pet parents can do? And then do you recommend like having that anesthetic dental procedure done and then starting these things like right away? Or like giving them a little break after, I guess it depends on the severity of what needs to be done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I love how you led into this question though, too, Jessica, because that is a really good nugget that I'd love everybody to take out of this discussion is the, the nomenclature, the difference between a teeth cleaning and 
a full dental procedure, which is tech, the technical term is a prophylaxis or a prophy. And even back in the day when I was growing up, I mean, they used it like dentists would commonly say a prof, you know, like you're coming in for your prophy. We kind of knew that word, but I think it's really fallen out of, you know, you know, trend where people today, probably the, your dentist never even says prophy anymore. They just say teeth cleaning. So you're coming for a teeth cleaning, but it is so much more than that. A full dental prophylaxis for a pet or a human is doing all the things we kind of just said. You're getting in there, you're, you know, curetting or scaling around, you know, under the gum line on the teeth, you're cleaning the tartar off the crown as well. You're probing all the pockets to see if anything's wrong. You're flushing out the sulcus from any junk that you've just freed up with the, by the curette. And you're taking x-rays of any suspect places. That is a dental prophylaxis. That cannot occur with non-anesthetic dentistry. So it's really nice for people to understand that when you are paying for a dental procedure for your pet, it is not just a quote unquote teeth cleaning. It is a full dental prophy, which is far more value than just a cleaning. Because if you just clean the pet's teeth and called it a day and woke them up and it's like, okay, good. You've missed the bulk of the, I mean, a big portion of the value is in getting in there, getting under there, finding any pathology, and then recommending the appropriate treatment to take care of it. So that's that side of things of, of yes. And I guess I can answer this question now, and then we can go back into the proactive is when is it appropriate to have a dentistry for your pet? Um, that is obviously variable. You know, everybody's an individual, et cetera. However, I can at least mention that there are certainly trends and most people who have had multiple dogs in their life would probably already know this just from their own personal experience. But there are trends in the fact that small breed dogs and especially toy breed dogs, like little bitty kiddos, are in general going to get more issues with dental disease and earlier advanced stages of dental disease, like earlier in life. And so veterinarians sort of lovingly joke about, you know, Yorkies are going to lose all the te all their teeth by the time they're five, you know, five years old. And so I joke with my clients, like when they're asking, oh, you know, I have Yorkie or, little, you know, and they have dental disease. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, you know, your kiddo's so cute, but they are the poster child of dental disease, you know? So it's just something to be very aware of that if you have a small or a toy breed dog, I would highly recommend that you get really conscientious about being as proactive as possible, as early in life as possible, even when they're young and they don't have any dental problems yet. Start brushing the teeth, start, you know, doing some good oral care to preempt, you know, that oftentimes progression that we see of, of dental disease in these small breed dogs. Um, and we don't know, I mean, part of it's probably genetics, by the way. Part of it is definitely anatomy. You know, I mean, certainly any brachiocephalic dogs, so any dogs with short faces. So, you know, your Bostons and your um, Boxers and your Shih Tzus and your, you know, all the, the little short faced kiddos, um, they're deaf pugs. Um, they're definitely going to have more dental issues as well. I mean, they're small and they're short faced. So you got all these teeth smashed into a short face. So, you know, you think of a, of a German shepherd or a lab or a collie or somebody with this long face. And they all have the same dogs have 42 teeth. Cats have 30, 30, 32 teeth. So, um, they still have to, you know, organize these teeth obviously in, in the, um, in the, the skull. And so when you have larger dogs, generally there's going to be less crowding of teeth and less plaque and tartar that's sort of smushing up in there, um, in between the teeth. And so in general, a small breed dog and certainly a brachycephalic dog are going to get more advanced problems. So more proactive uh, quality of dental care for them would be awesome. So when it comes to professional cleanings or prophies, those, do you know, small breed dogs really could sometimes benefit from every six months, you know, and it depends on, of course, their other qualifying health status. Do they have a good immune system? What kind of diet are they, are they on? I mean, clearly diet is going to play a huge role. Um, so if they're eating heavily processed food with lots of carbs, definitely every six months kind of thing. Um, but depending on the individual, you know, maybe annually, maybe every other year, um, often large breed dogs might be able to go every other year, that kind of thing. But in general, when you're looking or a veterinarian is looking to discern um, from an oral exam when a pet should get a dental, it's it should be more based on what the gums look like 
how much gingivitis there is, then it should be on the level of tartar on the teeth. Because again, the tartar is cosmetic. It's calcified. It's hardened plaque. It's plaque that's been sitting there. But if it's on the enamel of the tooth, not doing much. Um, but when it's at the gums, that's the big issue. So once there's gingivitis and the gums start looking angry or red or inflamed, um, or the gums bleed easily. If your pet's chewing on a relatively, you know, not like a super hard thing and their gums are bleeding easily, but, you know, first sign of gingivitis for a human or a pet is gums that bleed easily. So those would all be reasons where you would want to get that professional dentistry done for them. Perfect. Yeah, I I am so interested in the tips you have for preventive care. Um, it's actually one of my big I don't want to say New Year's resolution because I hate I hate that, but like something that I know I need to pay more attention to specifically in my dog. She's 10. And even though she has been raw fed since I adopted her, um, which was like almost eight years ago, she is just a little princess and she doesn't want to chew on on bones. In fact, like even the the pre-made raw that I buy her, if it has too big of pieces of chunks of bone in it she won't eat it it's like she's just a little princess when it comes to that <laughs> so i you know sometimes we just have to be more creative and so what are some of these preventive techniques that you can share with us awesome absolutely and i love that you let in with the bones we might as well talk about that because that is a great piece of the discussion for everybody to hear as well is what is appropriate for bones you did mention so astutely that not every dog is a good match for bones for various reasons some maybe won't chew them it's just not their thing and they're not you know attracted to it um so we find uh you know other options for them um sometimes it's because they gobble everything down and swallow it whole and so i always tell people you don't want to give your pet a bone or even another chew kind of toy or chew item especially for the first time you know if you don't really know their habits you don't want to give them something and then walk away and not be you know monitoring them and observing them because some dogs literally you give them a bone or a chew toy and they will swallow it whole and people have had to save their dogs by literally going down their throat and pulling stuff out so they don't choke um and so that's really important um and then when it comes to the texture of the chew item again there are things that are risky and dangerous to damage the teeth and injure the mouth and there are things that are much more appropriate and have a higher you know a, a high safety level and so it's really nice to address those when it comes to bones one thing that everybody should know is that raw bones of course are species appropriate for dogs and cats in the fact that evolutionarily that is part of their diet they would be consuming raw bones if they are fending for themselves in the wild but in general you are going you know a, a animal in the wild or a domestic animal that's on the loose and has to fend for themselves is going to catch something that is an appropriate size prey for them okay so you might have a dog or a cat that's eating a rabbit or a bird or a mouse or whatever generally you're not going to see a little feline chewing on, you know, a cow femur, right? So, um, so take that into account, but in general, raw bones are very safe, meaning that raw bones, if it's an appropriate size for their teeth to be able to eat, that that is going to just chew up, grind up and digest normally. If it is a cooked bone, when people cook their, you know, food, when people cook food, then the bones, the texture of the bones will turn brittle. And that's where bones can become dangerous to digest for pets because something that's brittle can splinter and break when they're consuming it. And then it could potentially perforate the gut or the intestines, et cetera, et cetera. So oftentimes, you know, obviously dogs have gotten away with it plenty, you know, they'll get some cooked chicken bones or whatever, and they'll, you know, the majority of the time that they're likely going to be fine, but you do run a risk. And obviously there are dogs that have been injured or even fatal cases of they consume cooked bones and it perforates their gut and they, you know, get the very, very sick and, and could, um, you know, demise from that. So we want to be very careful in the kinds of bones, raw bones. We also want to select um, bones that are appropriate size for them. You know, so, um, and, and then the other thing to know is that, um, again, generalization trends is that if they're hard, uh, you know, they're very hard objects are going to 
be much more risky to break the teeth. And so things that I should call out are antlers and hooves are some of the most risky items that you can give your dog to damage their teeth and break teeth. And it's estimated that at least one out of 10 dogs, at least 10% of dogs have a broken tooth in their mouth already. Okay. And they go unidentified a lot because it's difficult for veterinarians to see on an oral exam with a lot of dogs. And then unfortunately, a lot of general practice vets that aren't dental, you know, aren't dental specialists, depending on when they were trained and how much dental education they had in veterinary school, they may not even know that broken teeth are a problem. And they definitely are. They lead not only to pain, they're painful, but they lead to potential, eventually an abscess and a tooth root infection, et cetera, et cetera. So broken teeth are a problem. We want to avoid, th avoid things that are really hard. And so uh, you do want to avoid antlers and hooves. Bully sticks, way less likelihood, but could potentially, but ni uh, break a tooth. Nylon bones, you know, those are very, very hard and they're marketed for dental health and they're awful risk to damage teeth. So definitely I would avoid those. Um, what I like to tell people is veterinary dentists will say that a good rule of thumb is a, a safe chew item as far as damaging the teeth or not, is if you can bend the chew item, the bone or, you know, the toy, um, with your hands or dent it with a fingernail, then it shouldn't, it's not hard enough to damage the teeth. But if you can't bend it or dent it with your own fingernail, then potentially that could be stronger than the tooth where the tooth is going to give way before the item does. Okay. Now that said, statistically, it is more likely for a long, thin item to break a tooth. And the reason for that is when dogs chew on stuff, they're generally using what we call their cheek teeth to chew which is these big upper premolars and molars in the back. And they're sitting there and they're gnawing. And so if they're holding a nylon bone or an antler or even a bully stick or whatever, they're sitting there gnawing. If it's a small, thin item, then they have a lot of space for their teeth to come down and crunch on that, okay? And if that item is harder than the teeth, they have a lot of jaw force and they come down and, and then the tooth could give way. Now, if in contrast, they're chewing on a large knuckle bone or marrow bone or something that's occupying like a big old space where they don't have as much jaw space to come down on it, they're just less likely to break a tooth on those. So you could have a larger bulky item that's a little harder that might actually be safer than something that is thinner and longer and hard. Those would be like the big the big risky things. So it's nice to go through that discussion of, you know, chew items. Um, the other thing I would say is there's definitely things that are made that are helpful and safe in things like, obviously, I think most people are familiar with Kong toys. Um, the standard Kongs, a lot of times people stuff those with food, which is awesome because dogs will lick out, whether it's frozen peanut butter or pumpkin or all the, sometimes people even feed their dogs in Kongs to give them some enrichment and, and some, um, you know, time to eat things rather than woofing their meal right out of their dish. And that's all wonderful. They may or may not, certain dogs may or may not chew on that, but the Kong uh, brand does make a chew item or chew toy called the dental stick. And I should have had it. I have one for my dog Sage, but I didn't bring one to uh, show for a little demo. But the dental stick is like a round cylindrical shape rather than kind of that, you know, um, triangular shape that the, the typical Kong is in. Um, and it's got little grooves and striations that surround the whole circumference of it. And then it's got a, a center, an open center that you can stuff. So you can stuff little treats, freeze-dried treats, air-dried treats, whatever, in the grooves around it. And you could stuff the center of it. And it takes some effort for them to dig those things out of the grooves with their teeth. So A, it gives them something to do for a while, which is super awesome. And B, those little grooves have little striations, but just with that, you know, heavy duty rubber texture. So it's not going to injure their gums. That's going to rub on the, here you go, the gum line. It's going to rub on the gum line or more likely to rub on the gum line than a hard chew item would when they're chewing. So I really like those or something similar, okay, where you're stuffing it with treats and they can, um, uh, do some self cleaning, uh, uh what we call, um, active, you know, active cleaning, um, and so then passive cleaning would be, you know, we're doing it for them or whatever. So, um, so other proactive things, let's move into that category. Uh, we know everybody's going to be interested in that. And, um, and these are such important things to be aware of. So 
tooth brushing, definitely have to cover that. Is that obviously brushing the teeth still pretty much the gold standard in dental care is actively getting in there and brushing clearly your own teeth, but obviously for our pets, brushing their teeth too, to the best of our ability. So I love to tell people start young, you know, when you get a puppy or, you know, even for amazing, you know, superstar pet parents that have kitties, um, some kitties, you know, I have clients that brush their cat's teeth. And of course, by and large, it's going to be a more challenging issue to do that with a cat than the average dog. But there are a lot of cats that will tolerate toothbrushing, especially if you start young and you start wisely with it. And so I love to tell people start as young as you can to get them used to it. So before there's an issue down the line, they're, they're you know, very tolerant of this. Um, and when you do start brushing their teeth, start really slow, like literally just, you know, whatever you're going to use for a toothbrush, make sure it's a soft bristled brush, you know, that it's not hard bristles and you're not going to be, you know, damaging or, um, injuring the gums or even just, um, un, you know, causing pain to the gums because that's not comfortable. So something that's very soft bristled, some people use finger toothbrushes. Um, but also just start with like a second or two, like literally just touch the front teeth with it and, Oh, you know, good, good doggy, whatever. And, you know, follow it up with something positive, a treat or, you know, really great reward, um, incentive, and then, you know, build on that. So I would not recommend the first time you try and brush your pet's teeth to try and brush the whole mouth. You know, I mean, it's going to be a really daunting experience for them. And then they're going to run every time they see the toothbrush. Definitely follow up with something positive. I brush my te dog's teeth stage, my yellow lab, nearly every morning. Um, and I follow up with um, some treats that I put supplements in. And so she gets her teeth brushed, then she gets her one TDC. We'll talk about that in a minute. That uh, gets applied to her gums, and then she gets treats after that. So that's a really nice way of doing things. Um, and so I talked about the soft bristle brush. Obviously, there's a lot of toothpaste that are, um, you know, out there on the market that are natural ingredients. Uh, obviously, those are things you would want to use. Um, pet safe toothpaste, obviously not, you know, most human toothpaste would not be um, appropriate or safe for a pet. Um, I'm a big fan of using coconut oil. Okay, so I love to use coconut oil and put that on it too. Even coconut oil by itself without anything else in there is very therapeutic to the gums and the dental health and it tastes good. So dogs, you know, pets like it. Even cats generally are going to like coconut oil. So that's a really nice thing to do. Essential oils can be mixed in with coconut oil or you can use um, the actual brand Animalio, which is Dr. Melissa Shelton's um, She's a essential oil expert veterinarian, and she's got her line of essential oils, and she has a formula called Dog Breath, which is awesome. And coconut oil is the base, and then there's four essential oils in there that include um, helichrysum, myrrh, copaiba, and peppermint. And that blend is phenomenal for not only breath, but for addressing bacteria and inflammation in the mouth, et cetera. So those are kinds of things that can be used. Probiotics can be rubbed on the gums. That's another really good way of addressing, you know, the bad bacteria. Some people will make homemade toothpaste with probiotics and coconut oil and baking soda and, you know, even cinnamon and things like that. So there's some fun recipes out there and I do have some. Um, and then I can talk about a few others. I don't know if you want to interject with any questions or lead-ins for me, Jessica, but I do have a few other products that I would love people to be aware of as well. Yeah, and I think some of those other products are, are probably a little more passive, maybe, um, because I know, you know, if you do have an older pet, it can be a daunt, like, we know we need to do this, but it can be a little bit daunting to try to figure it all out. And I know, you know, I don't know if you have any special tips that you can give us for cats as well. I, you know, mentioned earlier that, um, you know, the first half roughly of my cat's lives, I did everything wrong, <laughs> right? Um, did everything wrong. I thought I was doing everything right, but I did everything wrong. And I have one cat in particular that I've, I've talked about on the podcast um, before because last year he and I had been, he had been getting dental, full dental under anesthesia cleanings every six months for a while, for a few years, because we've have been dealing with resorptive disease, which I know we haven't yeah. brought up yet. Um, and so it was just our thing that we were doing, you know, every six months to stay on top of this. And it seemed like 
he had been doing really well. And my vet was like, let's go a year. I think he can go a year. We went a year. And in that year, as we were approaching that year, he wound up, um, his blood panel showed he was hyperthyroid. So we had to get that under control before I could put him under anesthesia. And then once we did get him back under anesthesia, they pulled 17 teeth. He has six teeth left in his mouth. And so that was, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot for him. It was a lot for me. It was very touch and go for a while, um, especially because the pain meds they gave me weren't working. I'm in Texas. I was also giving him CBD, but um, from CBD Dog Health. But I needed more THC, and I couldn't get more THC because of where I am in Texas. It was it was a whole thing. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I don't want pet parents to be there. I don't want them to get to that point because it's not easy. It's not fun for you as a pet parent, certainly not for them. Um, uh, you know, I, it just happened that because he's hyperthyroid, he's like eight pounds. And I'm like, I can't, I can't let him go a couple of days without eating. And he didn't want to eat because he was in so much pain. So it was, it was a whole thing. So what are some of these right. preventive, <laughs> maybe more passive Absolutely. preventive things? Yeah. And, you know, since you brought up the resorptive lesions, I mean, we can just speak to that briefly too. That is a very common dental condition for cats, uncommon for dogs, but it can occur for dogs too. But these resorptive lesions that they get where the tooth actually starts to erode essentially, um, and there's really no way to stop it um, that, that we're aware of to date. So when this does happen, really the only the only treatment for it is to extract the tooth. Okay. So there are unfortunately, and usually once it starts happening, then it's a matter of time before, you know, other teeth in the mouth become affected. So it is not uncommon for, you know, cats to have multiple, you know, teeth extracted for, you know, that reason. Um, we don't really know exactly what causes that, um, condition. Um, certainly there is a lot of studies looking at a lot of, um, suspicion that there's an immune related, you know, immune mediated situation where, you know, the tooth is, is resorbing, um, or causing that, uh, resorption to occur. So again, anything we can do for our kitties or our dogs too, to support their immune systems. Um, and now, you know, too, I mean, the thyroid, you know, and there's a lot going on with your kitty and there usually is, there's a lot of layers to the onion of, you know, when there's things going on in the body, there's usually multiple, you know, sort of things that are overlapping. Um, and the thyroid gland is very involved with immune, immune regulation. Um, and all of the, I mean, the whole endocrine system is, is so critically important. And so if things are out of balance there, that could have also been one of the reasons why, you know, the immune system is, is more challenged or struggling. Um, but even when there's no identifiable, obviously thyroid or other endocrine disease, I mean, resorptive lesions are very, very common, but again, anything that we can do to support our pet's immune system, which obviously starts with diet and fresh food and species appropriate, um, diets, but also other good supplements that are, you know, sensible and, um, and very supportive for good health. So things, anything from things like your omega-3 fatty acids, your fish oils, which are, by the way, omega-3 fatty acids, amazing for inflammation and also known to be very good for dental health and, you know, gingival health. So that's one thing. Um, Antioxidants, you know, when we eat antioxidant rich foods or take appropriate supplements with those in them, then your antioxidants are protecting your cells from oxidation, which is damage. And so again, when your gums are being damaged, your teeth are being damaged, whatever, um, you know, those kinds of, of ingredients or, you know, supplements and, 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 or in foods are going to be very beneficial to set the stage for that pet to have and maintain a healthier mouth. Um, so those are good things to do too. Um, when it comes to kitties, as far as tooth brushing, I mean, again, I would just be, you know, as, as choosy as you can and as experimental as you can to see what works for your kitty. Um, small little brushes that are made for cats or little, you know, pediatric, even, you know, as long as they're soft bristled finger brushes might work again, just rub, even just rubbing something on the gums. Um, and again, you know, a fresh food diet, huge, huge, huge in that factor for, for prevention for cats too. Um, and then the other thing, which is amazing, um, for dogs and cats, 
um, is a product that I would love to just give a little demo. I have it sitting right here. This is one of my favorite dental care products that is super easy and passive to do um, as long as your pet drinks water out of a dish, okay? And we can talk about other ways that we can support pets if they don't do that. But this product called Teeth, um, and there is one for dogs and cats as well, and one that's just for cats. This, I just happen to have this one, you know, here, the one with just the dog on the box. But when you, and this is the, the sort of 201 packaging or 2.1 packaging, I should say, their original packaging was in a bag. Um, now it comes in a box and then there's a little glass vial in there with powder. It is a unique prebiotic powder that comes with a very tiny scoop and you put a scoop in the drinking water dish daily. Okay. If you have lots of pets, especially with it, you could do it twice a day, but the standard just, you know, prevention maintenance is once a day. This is a prebiotic, uh, formula of all natural ingredients that are helping to reduce bad bacteria in the mouth. So it's all about supporting a healthy oral microbiome. And so this product was developed by a, um, a human microbiologist, okay, who was looking at supporting humans with, uh, you know, uh, issues with periodontal disease or, or preventing periodontal disease. And then they made a pet product as well. And this was several years ago. This product works extremely well and it's got all natural ingredients. And what's happening is the prebiotics in here, there's a few of them that are supporting the good guys that we do want in our mouth to have a healthy mouth and to crowd out the bad guys that want to move in and cause periodontal disease. So there's some ingredients in there, vitamin B6 and L-arginine that are supporting the good guys in the mouth. And then there's a notable prebiotic ingredient that is reducing the bad guys. And what it's doing is molecularly, it's mimicking sugar, which is so cool. So bad pathogenic bacteria, they're going to cause more decay and plaque and disease in the mouth are generally going to be sugar loving bacteria, which is why humans who eat a lot of sugar, children that eat a lot of sugar, pets that eat a lot of high carb processed food, i.e. breaks down to sugar, they are generally going to have worse dental disease. But even if you have a healthy diet, depending on your genetics and other things going on in your body, you still will develop, you know, likely at least some depth and sometimes um, significant dental disease. And so this prebiotic ingredient is very attractive to the bad bacteria. They go bind to that molecule, but they can't use it for food. So they starve and they die off. So it's a beautiful way to get rid of bad bacteria. We're not attacking them with antibiotics and using, you know, antibiotics in the mouth or systemic antibiotics and getting rid of good guys. We're supporting the good guys. We're competing with the food source for the bad guys. So when they're drinking that in their drinking water, it's going to tie up all the bad guys and start getting rid of them and the mouth gets healthier. I have seen pets with horrific breath, we call it halitosis is the medical word for that, really bad breath, that within a week of getting teeth in their drinking water, people are like, oh my gosh, their breath is so better. I could barely be in the same room with them before without gagging, and now I can let my pet lick my face, and it's okay, you know? So it's really neat knowing that when your pet's breath gets better, that absolutely is a sign that their dental health is better because the whole reason breath is bad in the first place is because the bad bacteria are releasing those odors. So you know when those odors start to go away and decline that you've had groups of bad bacteria that are declining as well. And that's really exciting. We also see gingivitis get better and gum health, you know, start getting better. Um, as I mentioned, it works for cats too. There's a cat version. Um, the one high maintenance part about that, cause that's pretty easy to do is if your pet doesn't drink much water. Okay. Um, you know, some cats maybe don't drink a lot of water. Um, some dogs that are especially small breed dogs that are on a fresh food diet may not drink uh, a lot of water out of the, you know, freestanding dish. So if that's the case, the best thing that, you know, I would recommend to do is to uh, put this powder in a little bit of diluted broth or even diluted goat milk or something like that. But really the creator, Dr. Emily Stein says it should be about three quarters water and about, you know, 25% of whatever the liquid food item is, you know, broth or whatever you're using. Um, because if it's full strength food, then you're not going to get as much good competition for the, that prebiotic molecule to grab those bad guys because they're going to have enough food to go grab onto. Um, and so if you give it separate from food or, you know, a very diluted version of that, then, um, it's going to work much better. It's going to have more efficacy.
So if you do the diluted brothing, I would try to do it two or three times a day in between meals would be a nice goal. Um, if your pets drink out of the dish, just put it in the dish and that's all you got to do. Super easy and very, very effective product. And it's made for humans, by the way. I use the human version, um, which is a little tablet lozenge that's like mint flavored that you let dissolve in your mouth and does the same thing. So. Oh, I didn't know they had a human version. That's interesting. Yeah. It's called Daily Dental Cares. Yeah, I was going to grab that and I didn't grab it to set aside. But yeah, I do that. And it says, you know, on the human bottle, just so you know, it says ideally, I mean, obviously you don't want to take it with food because again, you'll get too much competition with the food for this product to be as effective. So the bottle says ideally do it right after you brush your, you know, uh, mm -hmm. put the lozenge in um, and let it dissolve right after you brush your teeth. So I do it morning and night. Um, and I love it. And I've had, I have clients on it that are like, oh my gosh, their dental health has gotten so much better to the point where their periodontist or their hygienist is, is really impressed. So, um, definitely works for people too. That's awesome. Do you have mm -hmm. any tips specifically regarding the, the teeth? Um, do you like to put down one bowl that has it in there and one bowl that doesn't or just? That's a good question because, um, it, it has very little flavor, but it's not a completely absent flavor. And there are some cats, it's rare for dogs, although I've had people tell me rarely, you know, like their dog won't drink it. Um, most dogs don't mind it at all, but I definitely have had, you know, people tell me their cats won't drink it. So you might want to put down two bowls and just see um, if everybody in the household is fine with drinking it then maybe you don't have to do that. Um, but that's probably a wise thing to do just in case somebody has an aversion to it. You don't want them to get dehydrated. So that's a really good comment to share. And just very selfishly asking this question. <laughs> um, I already, to my dog's water, add trace minerals because I do uh, spring, you know, non-fluoridated spring water. And then I add trace. So is it totally fine Excellent. to mix these? It's, it's to my knowledge, and I will check actually with the company, there should not be any interference. So I can't imagine that that would be any interference at all. Because even when you think about it, um, sort of standard, not that we want tap water because there's a lot of toxins, but standard water, you know, the minerals in there wouldn't be uh, interacting with that. So I don't think if you're adding minerals that that, you know, that would make any difference at all. But I'm happy to hear that you're doing that because that is a really good practice to have as well um, in remineralizing the water that if it's reverse osmosis, et cetera, or, or putting minerals in your pet's food. Um, and I do that, you know, for my dog too, because most of us are, and our pets are trace mineral deficient. So that is a really good daily, um, part of the regimen for their supplements. Yeah. So, yeah. um, those are all really great. I think, did you have, you had something called I have one more that I really like a lot. And that one is one TDC. Um, I know Dr. Karen Becker and Rodney Habib uh, had a dental segment on their inside scoop uh, within the last several months. And they uh, discussed this product too, because it was, uh, you know, the one uh, kind of premier known um, veterinary dentist did this clinical studies on this. Um, and this works really well. And I've been using this for years. So it's called one TDC. It's good for cats or dogs. Some cats like the flavor, but certainly it's a lot easier to please dogs. Um, many dogs like the flavor. It comes as a little gel cap. I can even show that too. Um, that's heart shaped and twist off. I cut it off cause that's easier, but there is a thick gel contents in there. Um, and it is a, they call it an esterified fatty acid. One TDC is just an acronym an acronym for the type of fatty acid that's in there, which is very hard to say, one tetraconal complex. So it's a mouthful. So that's what one TDC stands for. It's kind of an odd name. Um, but the the fatty acid that's in there is different from omega-3 fatty acids, not the same. So you still want your omega-3 fatty acids, very good for the for the mouth and the rest of the body. But this particularly, um, this formula helps to decrease inflammation and heal those tissues in the in the in the gingiva in the gums. Interestingly, this one TDC um, ingredient also helps for decreasing inflammation in joint tissue. So on the bottle, it'll say oral health and mobility. So it treats both. So it's a win-win for joint support and mouth 
you know, health at the same time. So that's our, it's big assets, um, is that naturally with, with natural mechanisms, it is helping to decrease inflammation in, um, the mouth and in joint tissues as well. And you just squirt that on the food? Yeah. So thank you for asking. So once you open the cap, you can just, um, spread it out along the gums, like just squeeze it along the gums. You could put it on your finger and then do that. If that's easier, especially with a kitty maybe or somebody with a small mouth, um, I like to, and I think the videos on their site show, you can just use the capsule and squeeze that and just lift up your dog's lip or down the lip. Um, it's, it's really easy to just put it on the upper gums and that's really all you have to do is lift up a lip, squeeze it on the gums on you know both sides, drop the lip. You can even use your fingers on the outside of your dog's lip and just give it a quick little rub in so it kind of rubs in there um, and then you're done. And they can eat the capsule. I let my dog, is a yellow lab. So she, she's a Labrador, so she loves everything. So I let her eat the capsule, you know, it's a gelatin cap that's obviously consumable. Um, if you just throw this in the food and they just consume it whole and you're not getting it on the gums, it will work great for the joints because it's going to absorb systemically and go there. Um, it will likely still do some work for the mouth, but if you open it up and apply it topically on the gums, then you're going to get a really good um, efficacy for the for the gingival health, the oral health, and it will still make its way to the joint. So then you get a win-win. So I always open it and put it in the mouth, but it still has um, efficacy, especially for the joints by just consuming it from the food. Perfect. Yeah. Well, my goodness. <laughs> there's, so, I'm, I feel like there's probably still so much more to say, but... <laughs> There is, but that was a really, really good, you know, synopsis and, and of the highlights, you know, of things that I think are really going to fuel people to, um, have the knowledge to support their pet's dental health better, which equates to supporting their pet's health better. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate this discussion a lot. Um, I guess I could add Jessica for everybody listening that we do my practice integrated veterinary care. We do have an online store, which we did put together over the last year to really um, give people a nice resource to get several of the products that I like to you know recommend and suggest for my clients. And when I teach, you know, on webinars and podcasts and things like that. Um, so you have one place that you can go to rather than having to go, um, find things in, in numerous areas. Um, but we do carry these things if they would like to find them through my site. Yeah. And what is the URL? I will make sure to put it in the show notes. Yeah. Probably. Thank you. So our website is, is uh, int vet care. So it's I N T V E T care.com intubetcare.com so short for integrated veterinary obviously um and then when you go to the menu bar there's a shop page and we've got everything that we um commonly you know dispense and recommend for our patients and and beyond um on that page awesome thank you so much for your time and your knowledge and i hope that um, people can really take away from this if not, like if nothing else, just how important dental health is for the overall health of both you and your pets, um, because I think we can we can often just forget about it. You know, we're not looking at it, we're not staring at it every day. It's not like you know exactly. we're watching our down the hallway. Exactly. <laughs> well said, Jessica. What a great closing comment. Um, I will share with you, you know, that veterinary dentists say that all the time in that because it's a hidden source of inflammation, you know, people aren't generally looking or able to look so well in the pet's mouth and see that. Whereas if that level of inflammation was rolled out onto their skin and it was this big, angry hot spot that covered, you know, the whole leg, I mean, that's a lot of, you know, inflammation um, area in the mouth that if people could see it, they would absolutely be addressing it to more of an assertive level. And so it's really nice for people to understand sort of that hidden quality of it and the fact that it is influencing and affecting the whole body. It's driving inflammation in all other areas of the body. So it really is a source of chronic inflammation. And the more we can do about addressing it and preventing it, oh, our pets stay healthier and happier and they have more vitality. That's one other tidbit I could add in real quick is that oftentimes when people get professional dentistry done um, and any disease that was in the mouth gets 
lift it out of there, you know, dental, whether there's extractions, whether it's just gum care that has to be done. One of the common feedbacks that I get to hear is, oh my gosh, my pet is acting younger. They're acting five years younger. Their vitality is back. I didn't realize their mouth was such an issue until I had it taken care of. And now I see my pet is thriving more. And wow, that was, that was really worth it. So it is really nice for people to, you know, get that perspective because it's, it's really nice to know that you're making that much of a difference for your pet. It sure is. So if you are interested in any of the products um, that Dr. Katie talked about, please check out her website, intintvetcare.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Kangas, for joining us today. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for everyone that's joining us. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the furry family coach just go to the furry family coach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only seven dollars that's the furry family coach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only seven dollars i can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside oh, oh.